we are um, getting through this book, and today we're going to talk about uh, chapter eight, which was a God for the Reformers. And I will admit, when I before I had read this chapter, I assumed that um, the author was talking about the Christian Reformation, and she actually covers uh, Reformation that happened in all of the great religions. And so we have to acknowledge that um, Christianity was not the only institution that changed over time, uh, but as well uh, did Islam and Judaism and Hinduism. And then of course, um, our, our own uh, understandings of God from the Christian perspective. But before we do that, uh, I'm, I'm reaching out to you here, Marilyn, uh, because you did such a fine job talking to, to us about the mystics the last couple of weeks. And I found a poem this week uh, on Facebook. Actually, I, I didn't go searching for it. It was just something I saw on a, a Facebook site that I follow. And this is called Ode to a Mystic. And so I'm going to read this uh, today for us as our meditation as we prepare for learning. My hope for you are the fires of transformation that burns away the dross of ego, leaving oneness, grace, and light. That you may breathe in the winds of being and rise with the wings of an eagle to soar, sowing life into each other, opening hearts and doors. For you are a spring of heaven, a breeze in the desert of life, giving hope to the hopeless and broken bringing grace and peace and light. And my prayer, my wish for each one of you today that as you practice whatever mystic practices are unique to you or special to you, uh, that these will be the gifts and blessings that you will discover in yourselves. All right, I want to uh, begin this morning since we're talking about Reformation and I thought it would be perhaps helpful <clears throat> um, to talk about what reform is. I know it's a seemingly a simple de definition, but we're going to come back to the question of um, what was the benefit or the value of the Reformation at the very end of the discussion this morning if we get through all the slides, and I hope that we will. So to reform something is to make changes in something, typically a social, political, social, including uh, religious, uh, experience, uh, social, political, or economic institution or practice in order to improve it. And so what I'm going to ask you at the end of class today uh, is to evaluate what we have talked about, what you have learned in your reading of chapter eight, and see whether or not you feel that uh, the world was a better place or our understanding about God was in a better place than uh, before the Reformation. So we'll just hold on to that for now. So we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm not going to go into a great detail about each one of these. I know there's, there were so many names and so many Hebrew words and Muslim words and all of that stuff. And I, I just, my brain gets lost in all of that unless I have time to really uh, sit down and study it uh, in a lot of detail. So I'm going to try to present uh, what I think is sort of the big picture of, of what she's talking about in this in this chapter. And so the Reformation really coincides with the time when Europe was emerging from the Dark Ages and the Italian Renaissance in particular, which uh, historically is deemed to have taken place between the 14th to the 17th centuries. And some historians have uh, called this, uh, this progress uh, during those centuries, uh, moving from the Middle Ages to modernity in civilization. It was the time of a uh, great scientific revolution, uh, beginning perhaps with Copernicus and Galileo. We'll talk a little bit about those guys this morning, um, understanding uh, that the planets uh, rotate around the sun rather than the other way. Uh, it was a time of great secular success, uh, the growth of the bourgeoisie, the, the merchant class or the middle, and the upper middle classes of the bourgeoisie actually had been around for several hundred years before this. Um, but this was a time when the economies were building and buying and selling was becoming very important. 
It was also a time that was marked by a great deal of anxiety over faith, uh, particularly in the Christian camps, uh, Catholicism and Protestantism, as we learned when we studied the history of uh, Christianity uh, split. Uh, but not only were, was there difficulties in the Christian world, it was also a period of great crisis for the Greeks, the Jews, and the Muslims. And I think that's why uh, our author talked about all, uh, all of those institutions in, uh, in this chapter and not just about the Christian Reformation. So we've all heard of the Jewish diaspora. We know that uh, beginning uh, almost 800 years BC with the coming of the Assyrians, uh, that the, many of the Jews were hauled away into different company, uh, countries, different locations. And that continued throughout history as we'll make uh, some reference to this morning. Uh, but in addition to a, a Jewish diaspora, there was also a Muslim diaspora. And she talks a little bit about this, uh, beginning uh, with uh, Constantinople being taken over by the Turks in 1453 and becoming uh, actually a center of the uh, Islamic religion. But sometime after that, uh, Muslims were being expelled from Spain. That occurred in 1609, and it was followed shortly thereafter by the deportation of the Jews from Spain, those who would not uh, convert to Christianity. And I think you all probably remember from our history class that um, the, the Catholic Church uh, gave the Jews living in Spain the option of converting to, to Christianity. And so those who converted, and I'm putting quotation marks there uh, because it was not necessarily authentic in every case, uh, were allowed to stay. But then they were continuously harassed and being evaluated for the quality of their faith and if they were found uh, not to be truly Christian, then uh, persecuted and, and perhaps even executed. Um, this was a time uh, for uh, Islam um, uh, to move away in the Islamic Reformation, to move away from uh, the science and the reason that they had been known for uh, for many hundreds of years up to this point and toward a position of greater conservatism in their faith and in their relationship with the rest of the world. And for the Jews, it was an evolution uh, away from uh, traditional Jewish activities and philosophies toward a more uh, mystical way of looking at their relationship with, with God. And we've encountered the word uh, Kabbalah before as the uh, term that references Jewish mysticism. And so both of these uh, Abrahamic religions were embracing new concepts about God. Uh, for the Muslims, there was a move toward greater conservatism. This was marked by increased attention to uh, Sharia law. We, we hear a lot about that in the news, uh, particularly in countries right now by, like Afghanistan, where uh, the Taliban uh, wants to uh, use Sharia law as the the way in which the country is going to be governed. And so people have to abide by the religious law uh, rather than by a, a secular rules and regulations. Uh, and that's not too different from uh, the way Judaism was practiced in, in those days. The Mosaic law was very important and uh, the Pharisees were the ones who were uh, charged with the responsibility of interpreting the law and telling people this is what the Mosaic law says about how we should be living. And, uh, you know, periodically evaluating their behaviors in, in, in that context. Uh, well, so Sharia was very much uh, in, that, in that same vein. Uh, the author says that at this time in history, it was not meant to be a, a repressive law as we have probably come to think about it in, in very negative terms in uh, the 21st century. But uh, what they wanted to do was to use the Sharia to, to be relevant to the lives of Muslims and to be a a guideline, if you will, for uh, how to live life in, uh, from the perspective of a good Muslim. And so the Quran became very much a manual for living. And one of the things in the process uh, that uh, sort of went away a little bit was Sufism. It was actually condemned uh, by that law. And you'll remember that Sufism was the mystical arm uh, of Islam. Uh, and we talked about that uh, last week. And so that was the Islamic attempt to find a, a more personal 
meaningful relationship with God uh, through each person having their own direct experiences, which is uh, coincides with what we understand about spirituality and, and mysticism. So uh, spirituality and rationality are both uh, kind of going away for the Muslims. Uh, they continued to move toward conservatism as uh, Western countries in Europe were embracing the Renaissance. Uh, there, were, there, there was the new empire in Asia Minor uh, that centered around Constantinople. And uh, two countries that um, became very powerful uh, Muslim nations at that time uh, were Iran, that was the Safavids in Iran, and that was the uh, Shia branch of Islam. And uh, we, we talked, I think, about the Seveners and the Twelvers. The Twelvers were the Twelve Imams um, who kind of ran things. Kind of interesting because it sounds like Twelve Apostles almost <laughs> uh, when I thought about the numbers uh, being uh, the same. And this is a time in history when there begins to be more conflict between the Shias and the Sunnis. Um, I was thinking about my experiences in the Middle East uh, with the military and uh, particularly with Iraq, which although it, I believe even at that time it was predominantly a Shia uh, population, I think 15 or 20 percent of the country was Sunni and it was Saddam Hussein who was in control and he was a Sunni. And Iran, uh, their enemy, uh, was, was primarily Shia. So uh, tremendous conflict and um, uh, dislike for one another within Isla Islam uh, as uh, people were identified in either the Shia or the Sunni, uh, Sunni tradition. And one of the Shahs, uh, Ismail, tried to uh, wipe out Sunnism, was not uh, successful. And then the Shahs, of course, persisted in Iran uh, clear up till the 1970s, 1979 maybe, or something like that, when the final uh, Shah of Iran was deposed and, and then the more traditional Islamic government uh, took over there. And then uh, there were uh, Muslims in India. These were known as the Mughals or the um, Mughals, sometimes it's written M-U, uh, not, not Muggles as in Harry Potter, <laughs> Mughals. <laughs> And I just wanted to give you a sense of the extent of these, uh, these kingdoms. I didn't bring my little pointer, but um, the Safavid Empire in Iran uh, began, you know, encompassed all of Iran that we, as we know it today, but then they also moved into uh, these areas north up into uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, all, you know, Russian, uh, parts of Russia nowadays. So very, very large. And the Mughals started in northern India in the purple and then moved into southern India where it's uh, colored blue there. So very large nation states that were formed uh, by these two religions. Uh, in Muslim, Mir Damad uh, founded a movement uh, of uh, Shi, uh, Shia or Shi uh, falsafas, philosophers, and um, their direction was uh, to embrace the enlightenment and psychological elements of the religious experience, which sounds a little bit mystical to me, even though there were places in Islam where that was being downplayed. And then Damad was followed by Mullah Sadra, who was one of his disciples. And some of the uh, beliefs that he left as a uh, uh, it's his influence on, on Islam was that God is the source of all things. Um, he, he taught about knowledge, which I thought was interesting. That's a very philosophical topic to, to think about when we think about ontology and uh, or, uh, what's the other one? There's another uh, big philosophical word that uh, denotes how knowledge is, is uh, transferred. I'll think of it here in a minute. Uh, but he talked about knowledge was, uh, gaining knowledge was a process of being transformed internally. It's not just me sitting here yakking and teaching you all about this book, uh, but it's actually uh, some, some internal transformative thing that happens within each of you as you begin to uh, gain some enlightenment from what, uh, from what our, our author has written about. Um, he taught that dreams and visions were the highest form of truth. Uh, mysticism was the best way to find God. And uh, 
interestingly, uh, we can have a union of God, union with God in this world, not just in, in paradise or heaven or the next, the next life, which reminds me of Jesus a little bit. You know, Jesus was trying to uh, help his followers understand that uh, God's kingdom was for now, uh, for, for the present life, not just for the later life. And um, I, I find it very interesting when I discover these little connections between Christianity uh, and other religions that uh, maybe we haven't been always the only ones to teach uh, certain, uh, certain elements uh, that, we, that we have found important. And then he also taught that paradise and hell are not literal places, but they are inner worlds. And how many times have you thought that person is creating their own hell because of the bad decisions that they have made? Or, um, you know, that person is really a living example of what it means to live a kingdom life, you know, a paradise life. Uh, so, again, uh, here's an, a Muslim who uh, teaches very much like uh, perhaps Jesus might have taught. And, yeah. Uh, in India, uh, the Hindus, which was a separate uh, religion from um, Islam, uh, lived very cooperatively initially with uh, Mughals. Uh, people in India at that time uh, saw the importance of having a unity of religions, uh, of identifying that all pathways to God are valid pathways, regardless of what an individual's uh, beliefs are. And there actually was an amalgam uh, created between Muslims and Hindus uh, in the formation of another belief system called Sikhism. How many of you know uh, people of the Sikh? Yeah. yeah, so a lot of us have encountered oh, them and the turban is, is very uh, distinctive for the men in, in Sikhism. Sikh. The Sikhs, yeah, S-I-K-H. Yeah. Um, and I worked with a Sikh ophthalmologist for a number of years at the old Bethany Hospital and he wore his turban and wore his um, blue bonnet for the surgery, for operating room over his turban. Uh, it worked out very well because the, those blue bonnets were pretty large, and so he could cover his turban and, and observe the sterility that was that was needed, and still um, maintain his uh, religious uh, belief. Yeah, but w what do you know about Sikhs? Those of you that have encountered them, or uh, we we have a, a Sikh person in our neighborhood. I see him out walking all of the time on my walks. Are they terrorists? Are they bad people? They like to dance or something. <laughs> What's that? They like to dance. They like, no, that's a Sufi. That's a Sunni. That's a Sufi. Sufi. Yeah, that's a, that's the whirling dervishes is what yeah. they're called, actually. They're very peaceful. Yes, they're very peaceful, usually kindly people, uh, helpful people, um, tend to meld very well in uh, societies where there are differences of beliefs. I, I have known a number of Sikhs in the medical world over the years, and they're some of the most wonderful people I've ever encountered. Uh, so they have maintained uh, this, uh, this kind of tolerance that was typical back in the, in the Middle Ages in India uh, and brought it forward into, into the world today. Uh, they believe that Allah and, and the Hindu God, the chief God, were uh, Brahman, were, were the same. And um, the, the main emperor at that time in uh, India, who was Akbar, uh, actually formed houses of worship where he invited scholars from all over the region to come together and, and exchange ideas. Uh, but unfortunately, when he passed away, uh, that uh, ultimately did not survive either. And, um, how many of you seen uh, the movie about Gandhi? Remember the, the tension between the Muslims and the Islam when, uh, when Britain left? And they ultimately divided into two countries and became Pakistan and India. And there was just tremendous hatred with one group of people marching north and one group of people marching south. And somebody started throwing rocks. And before you knew it, there was a big riot. And, uh, everybody got in a big fight. So uh, yeah, the tolerance uh, in India, unfortunately, did not last. All right, uh, let's move on to the Jewish experience during the Reformation. Uh, lots of anti-Semitism in the 15th century in Europe. Uh, the Jews were driven out of many cities. If you read the chapter, I was amazed she identified 10 or 12 cities that, uh, you know, major centers of, of civilization at that time out of which the Jews were expelled. And so uh, I guess to kind of cope with, uh, with, with the hardships of the time, uh, the Jewish religion developed uh, a mystical spirituality. This was really in the 16th century to cope with the challenges of exile. I think we, uh, Marilyn, I think you talked about Kabbalah 
uh, uh, last week. Uh, some of the Jews returned to Palestine, but it didn't really belong to them at that time and wouldn't again until 1947. But uh, they, they went back there to find uh, their spiritual home. Um, and a lot of the Jews turned away from the uh, falsafa, the philosophies, to the Kabbalah to have a more direct experience with God. And because they were literally shoved out of all of their living spaces, uh, they began to equate homelessness with godliness. Uh, and she talks a little bit about dislocation, being dislocated from your place as actually a source of uh, finding your own existence in the world, uh, being a stranger in a strange land, uh, those kinds of things. Those uh, became very, very important in Judaism. And so this, this new embrace of um, Kabbalah was, was the last time in Judaism, according to our author, that uh, all Jews pretty much accepted the same sorts of beliefs. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what some of the different uh, Jewish uh, entities or, or sects are today. Jewish Reform, Orthodox, and Hasidic. Okay. Are there more? Well, there, so um, I think I, I could be totally wrong on this. I think the Sephardic Jews and the uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jews uh, is more of a cultural difference, but yes, those are differences. And then differences in belief are uh, there, there are as many as five, three to five, depending on, on who you look at. Uh, but Orthodox, Reformed, Conservative are the three uh, main ones that, that I'm primarily aware of. Now the Conservatives would be calling the Hasidic. Oh, was, so and Orthodox are the ones that wear the hats that you see them at the Wailing Wall, often on the, on the news, and, and, and wear the phylacteries and have the curls in their hair. Oh, so that's, that's the Hasidic as well. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a cousin who converted to Hasidicism. Can, can you speak up a little bit? I, it's hard for me to hear with the mask. I'm sorry. I have a cousin who she she spent time in Israel and converted to uh, Hasidic Judaism. Okay. And when her mother died and she came here, um, she um, well we we made friends. Mm -hmm. Thank God. And um, when she she came over to say goodbye. Uh, she she couldn't even shake Russ's hand. Okay, That's because of her Orthodox beliefs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But she lives in. Uh, I think she's still alive. Uh, she lives on Long Island. Okay. In the river. I yeah. Think. I like I said, there's not even agreement, you know, on what the different um, aspects of Judaism are. I just know those are the ones that I've heard the most about. I guess. I don't know if it's appropriate to tell a Jewish joke here or not, but the the. Uh, how you tell uh, conservative from uh, uh, orthodox from reform? You may say, "Do you fast on Yom Kippur?" And the orthodox says, "Yes." The conservative says, "No," and the reform says, "What's Yom Kippur?" <laughs> <laughs> well, and that brings up a good point because outside of the religious Jews, there's also non-religious Jews. There are people who are culturally Jewish but don't practice their religion. So I guess that would be another. Uh, another section of, of Judaism. Um, well, anyway, the, um, this, this, this movement toward Kabbalah was um, primarily led initially by Rabbi Isaac Luria, uh, who's known as the hero and the saint of Kabbalism. And he sought uh, to help the Jewish people answer, you know, how come life sucks so much? Why is this so bad for us? And, and how can a perfect and an infinite uh, and a loving God create uh, this finite world that is filled with so much evil, particularly for our group, okay, more so than, uh, than for many others. And so it was out of that that this mystical experience of Kabbalah was, was created. Uh, the Jewish belief is that God had created a space and then he had vacated part of that region, uh, which is the earth of, of his essence or uh, of himself. And so if I understand this correctly from trying to read about it and understand a little bit, um, God's transcendence, God's um, wonderfulness uh, kind of pulled back. And what was left was God's stern judgment in, in this place, that his attributes somehow separated. Uh, this, this was what, what the uh, Jews at that time sort of came up with as an ex explanation. So the good part of God 
was remote and the part of God that was the uh, maybe the mean fatherly uh, aspect of God sort of remained with them. And then the world, uh, they began at this time to look at the world as a broken place. And that was uh, that's the only Hebrew term I'm going to really talk about today, Shevara. Uh, and that was um, a place, uh, the, the symbol is uh, pottery, vessels that have been broken into shards. Uh, so the world is this, this broken place symbolized by the pottery. And then that kind of came back again in the 20th century in uh, Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Uh, I think it was November 8th. I think it, the, the anniversary just passed of something called Kristallnacht. How many of you have ever heard of Kristallnacht 1936? What happened, Jeremy? Uh, the Nazis basically uh, broke into a lot of Jewish places and yeah, so so the Nazis were clearing a lot of the neighborhoods out of the Jews. Those were those were called pogroms or coming in and assaulting people. And on Kristallnacht, there was a wide countrywide, I guess, almost maybe the historian I'm not, but uh, they broke out all the storefronts, broke the glass, and uh, the, yeah, the broken the glass on the streets uh, was where the event that that uh, horrible event got its name, Kristallnacht, you know, the night of the crystals. Night of the broken glass. Light of the broken glass, yeah. And so uh, those events in the 1930s actually brought the Jewish nation back to this recollection of God has placed us here in this broken world and, and we're supposed to do something, uh, do something about it. And so the Jews of the diaspora at that time are called upon to help rebuild and redeem the broken word and the broken world and to get God back in the rightful place uh, with the people by keeping the commandments. I said I was only gonna talk about one Hebrew word and I lied. <laughs> uh, those commandments are called misquotes. Okay. So by, by being good Jews, uh, they could make the world a better place and, and hopefully God would, would come back and be with them again. Kind of reminiscent of when we studied about Ezekiel. And remember the people were taken away into Babylon and the people that were left behind in Jerusalem were not very faithful. And so uh, Ezekiel had this vision of God getting in uh, his Godmobile, his spiritual chariot, and, and leaving uh, Jerusalem and, and coming to Babylon with the refugees, if you if you remember that. Yeah. The broken glass happened over the 9th and 10th of 1938. 9th and 10th of November? Okay, I knew it had, had been real, also, real recent, yeah. Yeah, went into synagogues as well. Okay. Um, so compare this, uh, the Jews are going to help make the world a better place by being involved in, in the rebuilding of the world. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about uh, Martin Luther and the idea of you know, being saved more by faith in God and, and not necessarily by what we do. So out of the Reformation, we have two approaches now to how, how we're going to make the world a better place. Either we're going to be involved and we're going to help God fix it, or we're going to stand back and we're going to let God fix it and then by his grace, um, share it with us. Interesting, right? Um, this is a uh, this is a an art display uh, that is representative of the Shevarah. This is called Shevarah Hakelim, the breaking of the vessels. Um, I, I don't remember what city this was in, but I thought that's really uh, very interesting to combine uh, the big picture with with the shards of uh, pottery that you see there. I remember when I took uh, the, some courses on Judaism uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, I remember the rabbi talking about this notion of the world being like broken pottery and we're being called to, to get in there and help fix it. I didn't, he didn't mention Kabbalism or mysticism or anything like that, uh, but just that, that that was an important uh, belief that the Jews had about how things ought to be done. Um, so for the Jews, uh, even in, in the midst of all the horrible things that were going on, they developed this sense of optimism that humans were somehow participating in, in rebuilding the world and restoring the world and, and making it a better place uh, by sharing their good deeds, which, you know, a lot of that, uh, there, there's a Jewish holiday once a year, uh, one set on Shabbat. Uh, where on Saturday they will go out and they will help their neighbors. It doesn't matter, Jewish, Christian, uh, just people that need help. They'll go out and mow lawns, paint houses, uh, and, and that's um, a day where they celebrate the mitzvot, you know, the, the doing of good for other people and, and restoring the world. And um, they began to find a lot of meaning, a lot of significance in the suffering that they were having, uh, as opposed to the Protestants who were becoming more and more anxious over 
I'm sinful. Um, I'm fearful about uh, not being worthy of God's grace. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in a while about John Calvin and predestination. And they felt like maybe I'm not predestined to be in heaven and uh, the tremendous stress that that uh, put on a lot of the, the uh, Christians at that time. But Rabbi Luria uh, emphasized, you know, the spiritual exercises to achieve peace of mind and happiness and joy without having a lot of remorse or anxiety about how we were performing, you know, whether God was going to damn us to hell for all time uh, versus, you know, maybe life is not as bad as we like to, to think that it is. And uh, one of his tenets was that sadness springs from evil and anger is idolatry. Um, so to be sad, to be angry are not traits that should be should be human traits. We should try to move away from that and become better, more positive people. What are your, what are your thoughts? Anybody like that? I like that a lot. <laughs> I, I, as I was that reading through this. Really good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Paul? Yes. Why do you think, um, why isn't Judaism more appealing if they're, they seem to have more positive outlook on life than at least the um, reformers did at that time. I can't see what was this, I'm a wretched person, how that was so overwhelmingly accepted. And I don't know, they're just to me, uh, I think our church leans, at least leans more towards the Jewish approach than the Protestant or the wretched center approach that most of Christianity seems to have. Yeah, well, it's a very good question, and I'm going to be very sarcastic in my answer uh, to that, Dennis, and say that it's hard to overcome uh, 2,000 years of, of, of Christians believing that the Jews killed Jesus. Okay, I, I, I can I think, see the point, but it's just... You know, I've, I have found beauty in, in every religion. I have found beauty in other Christian religions. I, I love going to Catholic Mass. I love the symbolism of the Mass. I love the liturgy. Um, I, I, I love, you know, I love my experience, uh, sitting under the tutelage of a rabbi for 16 weeks and, uh, hearing what he had to explain about what, you know, Jews really believed. And we got, we got a taste of that with, uh, uh you know, with the recent books we studied in this class about the Jewish perspectives of Jesus in the new Testament. Um, so, so I think there's a, a lot of good out there that unfortunately we never take the opportunity to uncover that or to discover it uh, because of our personal prejudices. And I, that's my opinion. I don't know that that's the right answer to your question, uh, but I feel like, uh, you know, prejudice is a pretty powerful uh, force in the lives of a lot of people. And I think it prevents us from experiencing all the beauty that's in the world um, when, when we can't get past uh, some of our stereotypes and, and beliefs about others. Okay. Answer, Dennis, are you okay with that? Well, not that people would necessarily convert to Judaism. I was wondering why Christianity didn't take at least take the Jewish approach more positively. Uh, I know this chapter talks about the anxiety over science and the changes that were going on. And it seems like the Reformation compounded the, yeah. the gloom and doom. Yeah, yeah, well. We'll talk about Martin Luther here in a minute, and maybe some of that will um, well, be an answer uh, I, to that. But I, One of the things I, I've always felt is um, there was the prejudice from outside the Jewish faith, and part of that turned the Jews into being very much like we, the RLDS and the Mormons were. We kind of became such an enclosed clan. We didn't reach out because of all the outwardly threat. Um, but um, I think, you know, it's kind of a two, two edge prone there. Um, honestly, I think if I had not been RLDS, I would have become Jewish because I personally love so many of the things they, yeah. they do and believe. And, and I believe that, you know, my experience in, in going to classes and going to the uh, synagogue and, and being with the people on Shabbat, you know, they're uh, their religion is much more about the community than a lot of Christian yeah. faiths are. And, and I wish Christians understood how much of what we believe actually comes from Judaism. We might think differently about it. I agree. 
So anyway, the hope of the Kabbalist practices was that people could find, um, I gotta move, I've got your pictures here in my way. Let me see if I can minimize that. Okay, Paul. Yes. This is Jane. I, I just wanted to add to the conversation a little bit that, you know, at least in, in Nazi times, and I would say even now, there was a jealousy of the way that the Jewish people kind of not only practiced their religion, but they really were successful in everything that they were doing. And so they were easy to blame. And I, I think that's the that's the bigotry that we even have in America of, you know, that's that Jewish banker kind of a thing. Well, and how, yeah, how can people be successful if, if they're not, you know, they're not Christian? We, we can't, you know, we can't deal sometimes with our understandings about who God blesses and who God doesn't bless. Yeah. When it doesn't coexist with our paradigms uh, very well. Well, and they were actually forced into those roles because they were not given any land because they were Jewish. And so they took right. roles of yeah. trader and banker and stuff. And, they, and then we got jealous about that. And right. The, so the Na- yeah, the Nazis just made them an easy target because everybody else was poor and, it was, and the Jewish people were finding a way to be successful post-World yeah. War I. So... Arlene, did you have a comment? Well, you have to talk really loud so the, yeah. so the speaker can The uh, human existence seems to want a scapegoat, and they were a scapegoat for yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, I put a couple of pictures up here. Um, so the hope was that the Jews could find joy and kindness in their community without focusing too much on the punishment aspects of their uh, of their existence. And I, I know a lot of you have seen uh, Fiddler on the Roof and, and watched as Tevye and his family were forced out of Anatevka in the Russian Revolution. And then, of course, the gathering the Jews up in World War II to go to the concentration camps. All right, let's turn to Christianity um, and uh, what the medieval church uh, kind of believed coming up to the Reformation. Um, at that time in history, we saw how you know God was um, very transcendent. Uh, didn't always feel like God was necessarily with the people, but the the church hierarchy was more the representatives of God in the world, and the focus was really on the distance between God and humanity. Uh, prior to the Reformation, the focus had been on imitating Christ, and they thought more about the pain and suffering of Jesus, and uh, rather than thinking about the resurrection and the uh, maybe the message of, of new life or resurrected life. And so the, these are the words of the author, not my words. Uh, it was a dour, gloomy religiosity. <laughs> and remember way back in chapter one, when I talked about um, the author's biases, I mean, she came from a background that I think um, she probably has some, some belief systems or paradigms that are unique to her experience uh, growing up in a very tough Catholic environment and then going to a convent. And I feel like she, for my money, she was a little negative here, <laughs> but, but maybe she's right. She's very knowledgeable and educated on this. Um, and, and I think, you know, while yes, we, we do think about the pain and suffering of Jesus and you have uh, movies like the, what was the Mel Gibson, uh, Mel Gibson movie where it was so brutal and the beatings and all of that stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus. It was the movie about Jesus, the no, crucifixion. No, no. He was the, yeah, he was. Passion the, of Christ. Yeah, yeah, Passion of Christ. I mean, everybody was just stunned by the images, you know, of that. Uh, and I think that the focuses were a little bit heavy on, on that side of it. Um, not that it didn't happen, it did happen. But um, then there was the witch craze, um, the fear of Satan, the fear of demons, uh, the importance of personal piety, and then you know, doctrines of the church were more more important necessarily than our experience or relationship with God. Uh, Paul, would that be the 16th century? Um, what, what? So, so Martin Luther was uh, the late 1400s, I believe. If I okay. remember, I don't remember the exact date. 14, somewhere in there. Um, so, starting in the in the 15th century, 14th to 15th century, kind of coming out of the medieval times and moving into the Reformation. Um, she points out that uh, a lot of the medieval theologies, Martin Luther obviously didn't like some of the things that the church was doing, 
but he was very orthodox. He believed in the traditional beliefs, and that's what he initially, we learned in, in the history of Christianity class, was trying to do is to pull the church back to, you know, some of the more uh, original practices and, and beliefs. So it wasn't that he was just progressive and wants to leave it all behind. He just wanted to get rid of the stuff that he felt was, was not right or not appropriate. Um, then she points out that the rise of nationalism and individualism in Europe was uh, important. Each country kind of getting their own religion or their own faith background uh, that corresponded to um, this uh, feeling of, of nationalistic pride. Uh, the laity were becoming more informed. They're actually beginning to have some awareness of uh, theology and be able to talk about theology, whereas several hundred years before that, it was only the academics who uh, really got to, together and discussed uh, theology and philosophy. And people were beginning to explore the internal consequences of religion. I'm not entirely sure what uh, she means by that, but I think they were they were looking at religion and saying, you know, why am I going to church and listening to the mass or doing this or that? Uh, what what does that mean to me? What does that mean to me as a, as a person? Um, how is it, you know, is it making my life better or is it making my life harder? Did printing have anything to do with this too? Did what? Printing. Printing? Yeah. Um, so it certainly made copies of the Bible uh, more readily available. Um, I think Gutenberg, wasn't he one of the first ones to, yeah. to print the Bible, whereas before they were all had to be hand scribed. Yeah. Um, and if you go, you guys I know have probably been um, to Europe and seen the pulpits where the Bibles were chained to the pulpit so that nobody could remove them from the church. Mm -hmm. And many times, you know, only the priest was literate enough to actually read them and, you know, also gave the interpretation. So made it very convenient for uh, officers in the church to, to say, this is what God wants us to do because I can read it and you can't. Um, in, in the Greek church, the iconography uh, was kind of like the flannel graphs that we had as kids in Sunday school. Uh, you, can't, you can't read the book yet, but you can sure see the pictures of Joseph and Mary and the baby going to Bethlehem. <laughs> Uh, and, and so the iconography was important in, in Orthodox Christianity for teaching the stories and getting people to, to think about uh, Jesus. I wanted to read uh, page 276, a little bit about Martin Luther's struggles. Uh, he says, although I lived a blameless life as a monk, I felt I was a sinner with an uneasy conscience before God. I could not believe that I had pleased him with my works and far from loving that righteous God who punishes sinners, I actually loathed him. I was a good monk and I kept my order so strictly that if ever a monk could get to heaven by monastic discipline, I was that monk. All my companions in the monastery would confirm this and yet my conscience would not give me certainty. And I always doubted and I said, you didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. So this is Martin Luther moving away from, uh, you know, this idea of works and being able to please God by what we do uh, and his uh, sort of personal uh, discovery of, of this concept of grace in the writings of Paul and what that meant for him. Um, the author says Luther believed in witchcraft. He saw life as a battle against Satan. Uh, again, I'm being a little bit sarcastic and facetious. I heard a comedian uh, talk about his upbringing in his church and how tough it was at times, uh, and he uh, facetiously referred to the loving wrath of God. <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is, for me, says it all. That's what the people were going to is we're trying to understand, you know, do we have a personal relationship with, with some God who really hates us when we're not good? Um, and you think about the dichotomy uh, that that would bring to a child growing up if, if a parent behaved that way. Uh, and wasn't conditionally loving, even when the child is bad, uh, you know, the child is, is going to um, probably be, feel very disturbed and, and, and uh, not worthy. Paul? Uh, yes. I uh, hate to interrupt, but, but do you think some of these reformers, I'll, I'll just pick on Luther, do you think some of these guys had some psychological problems? <laughs> Let, let me let me let me go another slide or two, Dennis, and then I'm going to ask you the same question. Okay, okay. Well, I'll say yes to start with. <laughs> if, if they didn't have psychological problems when they started, they did after they became mm -hmm. uh, Protestants. Um, so the focus was on sin, death, and damnation. God controlled human affairs in a very stringent way. Um, 
humanity is unable to extract itself from its fearful predicament without God's help, and men and women can contribute nothing uh, to their salvation in juxtaposition to the Jewish belief that, hey, we ought to be helping in this. Um, good deeds were not meritorious, but only a response to grace, and only God can provide for the justification for salvation. Somebody tell me what justification is. That's a theological concept. Sometimes I don't believe it. It's as if I've never sinned. What's that? Just as if I've never sinned. Yeah, so that's, we were justified, excuse me, we're justified to be saved in the kingdom, even though we don't deserve it, even though we're, you know, bad people all of our lives. It's it's God who provides that. And so where Luria, Rabbi Luria had taught that God was only found in joy and tranquility, Luther claimed that God is only found in suffering and the cross. And so now this is, uh, Dennis, coming back to your question, this is what the author says about Luther. Even though Luther appealed to his experience of being reborn, you know, we should be happy if we experience that uh, transformational rebirth in the waters of baptism, right? Um, it should make us feel much better about our lives and about our relationship with God. But she says the, uh, that he remained a disturbed, angry, and violent man. He was a rabid anti-Semite, a misogynist, convulsed with a loathing and horror of sexuality, and believed rebellious peasants should be killed. His vision of a wrathful God filled him with rage. I feel like I know people like this. Mm -hmm. I have encountered people like this in my life who uh, are so focused on the loving wrath of God that they are internally angry and that is expressed in their, in the way that they express their beliefs to me sometimes. I, I feel like I've met a few people that fall into the category like that. Anybody else here? Mm -hmm. um, Jerry? Well, I'm not sure that this is on point with your specific question right now, but since we are talking about uh, Luther and uh, justification, I think it's interesting. It might be interesting to know that our own doctrine and covenants refers to the uh, uh, belief of uh, justification, and it's very clear on that. Mm -hmm. in a very short uh, sentence or two in. Uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenant 17, it says mm -hmm. justification by faith. Is yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I'm not saying that that uh, isn't part of uh, Latter day Saint theology. It very much is. That's a good point, and I probably should have brought that up too. But I think it, it's interesting that it's in there because you don't find very many statements that draw on a proposition like that. To yeah. Say, well, this is what we're saying. Yeah, but it's, you know, this, this marks a, um, a movement away from. Um, Orthodox Christianity, where um, our relationship with God was earned through going to confession um, and, and, and doing good works. You know, I, like the paragraph that I read about Martin Luther, he never felt that he could do enough good works to, to feel like he was in good standing with God. He felt that it had to be something outside of that. And so um, in, in reading through the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, who, who talked about grace and, and so forth, he um, deemed that to be the pathway by which Christians need to move toward a closer relationship with God. And that certainly is in our doctrine and covenants and, and part of our history, absolutely. All right, so Dennis, I got a question for you. Was Martin Luther crazy? <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> I think he was, or at least he inclined that way. Why did he appeal to so many people? Were they all, uh, I guess we found out that if somebody's angry, there are other angry people that will join with them. So was that why he became such a leader? Well, so, you know, why, why was, I, I don't know how, well, we'll talk about Calvin now, and you'll kind of see how this continues to be passed along in, in the Reformation, the beliefs of the Reformation. Uh, I don't know how people lived in such fear for so many years. Um, I, I think if you weren't, that's what I'm saying, if, I don't, if you weren't crazy to begin with, I think you could certainly be uh, very, feeling very disturbed uh, before too long. Well, yes. it seems to me like, People who are really by the book, you know, you have to follow the rules 100%. They're the ones that get angry because they pe see people that are not following the rules that get by with it. Mm -hmm. And so it puts an anger within them that, you know, 
here I'm trying to do it right and they're not and they get by yeah, with it. Yeah. My, my late sister used to tell a story that she was uh, going to visit somebody at St. Luke's Hospital. And I don't know if any of you have been to St. Luke's, but they've got that multi-level parking lot. And sometimes it's hard to see the cars backing out and so forth. So she was kind of zipping in there, probably knowing her probably driving too fast. <laughs> um, and somebody else was backing out. And they almost ran into each other. They, you know, just really a near miss. And she said the guy got out uh, and started cussing at her. And she was really um a little bit fearful for her well-being and then she realized it was her pastor she was not a member of this church <laughs> this was from a baptist church but uh you know yeah sometimes i think you know uh, uh maybe maybe there's some element of um, you know our personality that is determined by uh, some of the things we encounter in our religious life maybe maybe uh, uh luther was an obsessive compulsive person I could. I, I think you had to be uh, to live to live life at that at that level. If you're that worried about how good or bad you are all the time. Well, and didn't he post like 99 problems with the church? I mean, that's pretty obsessive. I think it was 97. <laughs> good point. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Let it go, Luther. Uh, <laughs> All right, so in order to finish, I'm going to move forward. I want to come to the last question that I first posed when we started the class. Um, now we have Calvinism and the rise of the Puritan Revolution in England in the 1600s. Um, we talked about Calvinism in our history class, so we'll hopefully remember some of that. Uh, but it was interesting that the author points out that there are some of the tenets and um, maybe more societal and, and cultural aspects of Calvinism that have been passed down to American culture, even uh, amongst individuals who are not necessarily identifying themselves as, as religious. Um, Calvinism became very uh, popular with the bourgeoisie, with the middle and upper middle classes in um, 17th century uh, Europe, uh, and things like work ethic, you know, work hard and you'll be successful. Put in the hours, um, Jane, you're an attorney. Uh, tell me, isn't it, you know, kind of, uh, aren't attorneys kind of notorious for putting in a lot of hours to, to be successful in their practices? <laughs> well, it, it's worse than that. That's, that's what, it, that's what is expected of the young lawyer. So they, they, they kind of cultivate that personality of working too hard. And yeah. I personally, after 33 years, I don't think it's very healthy. Yeah, and, it's, and Jeremy, we could probably talk to Jeremy about what his uh, years as a medical student and a resident were like, because a lot is expected of people in medical training in the, in the same way. So work ethic, uh, this idea of, you know, we're special in America, this is, we're an elect people, a chosen nation, uh, whether or not you see that in terms of some divine purpose that God has in mind, uh, it's very easy to feel better than everybody else, uh, knowing that you came from this, this country. Hey, Paul, yeah. I, I have a question. I, um, I, I'm not real familiar with Calvinism, but my nephew is in, you know, kind of the conservative Baptist movement now. And Calvinism is really, really popular among that, that side of Christianity. And I kind of wondered why. Well, I think this next, the first point on this slide maybe speaks to that a little bit. Um, Calvin really wasn't interested in dogma, uh, but more so in what, uh, what could uh, those Christian beliefs in, in, from his perspective do uh, societally and politically and economically. And so just as Islam had uh, Sharia law that they wanted to uh, influence every, every aspect of life and the Jews had Mosaic law that could influence every aspect of one's life in Calvinism. Uh, they wanted Christianity uh, to, to be the influence of, of everything that we do say and think. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I just, as you were asking that, I, I saw that statement there and it seemed like a possible answer for you. What do you think? Yeah, I, I actually think that's probably true because it's like if there's any kind of problem in life, then it can be solved by something from the Bible. You know, I mean, it's very, very specific. They have Christian counselors, you know, 
and and it, it doesn't seem like they go outside of the Bible for yeah. their for their you know any any solutions. There's always a solution in the Bible. So it's just kind of interesting. I you know I we just got done interviewing applicants for our program for next year, and we talked to about ninety people over the course of five days. And I'm you know I. I, I bear no biases or prejudices one way or another when people um, incorporate religious talk into their answers in an interview, but it's amazing to me always how many people will say, um, I'm here because I want to help people and because I feel Jesus wants me to do this. That's a strange thing to me when you're in a professional setting like an interview that's going to determine whether or not you get into a program that will make your life what you think you want it to be. Um, and I, I don't, maybe that influences some people in a certain way. I kind of tend to disregard it, I guess. I, I want to know more, uh, you know, how do you take care of patients in the ICU? And, you know, why do you think this is a good, uh, a good career for you, uh, given the amount of stress and work that you're going to put into it the next three years just to learn what you're doing. Uh, but, you know, some people feel so strongly that that you know, there's no difference between the secular part of their life and the religious part of their life. So they're comfortable bringing that up in an interview. Um, I don't know if others have ever experienced that or interviewed people that kind of came in that way. It, isn't that really part of early Mormonism? And isn't that part of our restorationist background? Yeah, probably. That, that stewardship extends over everything? I, I, I'm torn between how appropriate it is to bring that up yeah. in, in a professional interview. But we've talked for decades about how our life should be um, both secular and, and religious should be combined. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's one life and it's dedicated yeah. stewardship. Is, uh, yeah. I, I think it is for the individual. I, I, that's why I say I have no biases against it. But in a very uh, secular setting, such as a hospital where you have people from all walks of faith, and I mean Hindu, Sikhs, Buddhists, Mormons, uh, other Christians, Catholics, uh, you know, lots of Muslim people. Um, that that just to me is an unusual thing to talk about. If you yeah. can, but in a more general sense, I guess. Well, when I interviewed at Johnson County Community College, I did not bring my religion into it. Yeah. So I, I I agree in a sense that it, it seems inappropriate, and yet at the same time. My background says, mm -hmm. why should it be separate? Yeah. Well, and I think if, if somebody asked me that question in an interview, uh, I have no problem with saying, uh, you know, they'll, they'll ask, what, what leadership roles do you have? I say, well, I have leadership roles in my church. I teach Sunday school. I've been a pastor. You know, then I feel like that's kind of an invitation maybe to use some of that because it shows a person as well-rounded. But, um, you know, why do you want to be a nurse anesthetist? Well, because Jesus told me to, that just, to me, is a lot. Yeah, I, I kind of am like you, Paul, in that, you know, religion, politics, um, things that could be controversial of it in any way should not be brought up in a job interview. Um, Unless you're invited to talk about it, you know, that's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to get, uh, I'm taking this down a rabbit hole that I didn't intend for us to go in. Um, the other thing about uh, Calvin uh, was he was a Trinitarian and he actually had another, had another theologian whose name was Michael Servetus uh, burned at the stake for being a monotheist. And Servetus is known as the first Unitarian martyr because the, universe, uh, the Unitarians believe that Jesus was not divine but was a specially loved teacher who taught the way of salvation uh, and that really only God can provide salvation. Um, so, so Calvin was not a terribly tolerant person. Um, the Calvinists rejected the notion that any intermediaries or veneration of the saints could, could work on behalf of um, human relationships with God. Um, and Marilyn, I would love to spend some time talking to you about um, the, the different intermediaries that, that you're aware of. Unfortunately, I'm not, I'll have to do that another time. But I was looking, I guess there are, there are 10,000 people who are saints, uh, patron saints uh, of all different kinds of activities, and including a patron saint of academia, which I thought was neat. And that's um, Thomas Aquinas. So I, I feel a new sense of 
relationship with, with Aquinas. Uh, Puritans were noted for destroying Catholic statues of the saints and the Virgin Mary and destroying other religious artworks, uh, which is sad in itself. Uh, and then Calvin was an ardent supporter of predestination. And this was a theological, philosophical conflict uh, that made it difficult for people to figure out if God is fully omniscient and, and omnipotent um, and, and knows in advance what our decisions are going to be, what our lives are going to look like, and we're even to the point of we're going to be predestined as to whether we fall in the group of people who are saved or the group of people who go to hell and are not saved. Uh, then what's the role of free will? How can we have free will if all of that is somehow preordained or pre-known? Um, and Calvin can never really explain um, why some people chose to believe in God and others did not. Uh, and if, you know, if that was foreordained, then, you know, why would God knowingly in advance condemn some people to damnation by, you know, setting them up to not accept it, you know, that, this is the argument. This is the conundrum that uh, sometimes we, we uh, get ourselves in when we have these kinds of discussions. And it just seems terribly unfair to, to think about God in that way. But for Calvin, um, it worked. Hey, Paul. Yes. I'm going to have to disagree with you a little bit, at least according to Armstrong, that it, she says that Calvin really predestination wasn't central to his thought. I, I don't know if he disagreed. He didn't really disagree with it, I think, but yeah, I it was actually, his follower that was the big uh, was guy. Beza, uh, that made it the center, central tenet, but I think he was the one who developed the concept initially. So yeah, I, I would agree with you. I'm you're, you're not incorrect on that. Um, so anyway, Beza was the one who actually made the concept of predestination uh, one of the important tenets of Calvinism. Um, and this obsession, this is back to your question of, you know, uh, does this cause uh, disturbances for people? And this is the author saying that she believes that obsession with predestination led to fears of not being saved, which led to depression and suicide for many people. And the process of conversion is not as we think of it today, where a non-member comes into a community uh, such as, you know, Mission Road Community of Christ and experiences a sense of joy at the relationship of being with uh, the people in this congregation and perhaps is introduced to uh, beliefs uh, in, in God and Jesus and becomes a, a very positive experience. Uh, in those days, conversion, uh, you, you had to prove that you were converted. Uh, it wasn't that it was just assumed that, you know, if you ask for baptism, that must be proof of your conversion. You, you had to uh, make sure that you actually uh, one of the people who wanted to, to be a Christian. Um, Calvinism also led to literalism in interpreting scripture, and uh, there was lots of difficulties when there were conflicts uh, between scripture and, and what science was uh, discovering in those days. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. So uh, the Renaissance in Europe for Christians and the Reformation was marked by the domination of all life by religious issues, fears and anxieties about being worthy of salvation or one of the elect, concerns about eternal damnation, fear of a terrifying God, distrust or hatred for those in opposing camps, and martyrdom on both sides for unprovable views. And again, these are the author's points, uh, not necessarily my own. And then last, we have early atheism. And this uh, really started at the end of the 18th century in conjunction with the uh, People who, who were taking a more literal uh, view of the Bible at that time. And there began to be a few Europeans who uh, actually were denying or questioning the existence of God. And so that's atheism in the modern sense, not atheism in the sense that we have been uh, talking about it in, in this book up to this point. Up until now, um, an atheist was simply somebody who didn't believe with your way of, of looking at, at the world uh, in terms of God. And she says, calling someone an atheist was actually a projection of buried anxiety and was an insult equivalent to identifying someone as a hypocrite. Uh, you don't believe like we should believe in community of Christ. You're a hypocrite. You're an atheist. Uh, it's it's kind of how that would play out. And so finally, Thomas Beard described an atheist as someone who denied the providence of God, the immortality of soul, and the afterlife. 
at, at that time, this is the old atheist, but but not the existence of God. So you could still believe in God and be an atheist, but just not um, have the same creed that, that I have. And then a little bit on atheism and science and scripture. Aristotle was the first person to suggest that the universe revolved around the, the earth. And that was the common belief for uh, thousands of years. And then along comes Copernicus. And based on his observations of the changes in the sky at, at night or whatever, he predicted that uh, actually it might be the sun that was the center of the universe. And then Galileo uh, with his telescope uh, was actually able to observe some of the moons of Jupiter. And he saw that the moons were not uh, circulating, circling, circling around the earth, but the moons were circling around Jupiter, which was not consistent uh, with what the Bible said. And so he developed this uh, theory uh, that perhaps the sun was the center of planetary motion, at least as far as he was able to see. Uh, with his telescope. And I didn't realize this until I did a little research. The problem for um, the religious in, in Galileo's time uh, had to do with the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And so if we put the earth in motion rather than the earth is stationary with everything else spinning around, when Jesus ascended in, in, at the end of Matthew up into heaven and, and said, I'll be back, um, if, if the earth was moving around, how do they know that Jesus hit heaven? Because okay, heaven was supposed to be straight up and that's where Jesus went. <laughs> yeah, so, so, but if the earth is moving around, he might've missed and gone, you know, gone to the moon instead or something like that. I know that's an argument, but that is the essence of what, you know, people, that, that was the argument in those days was the ascension doesn't work if, if the planet is moving. And they'd really hate it to know that the sun is also moving through. Yeah. The universe at the same time. Uh, so I learned something. That was the first I ever heard of that. I think isn't there also a reference to the four corners of the earth in the Bible? Yeah. And so that would it's hard to have corners on a, on a, on a, on a sphere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then uh, people believed uh, hell was at the center of the earth because Dante said it was so. And uh, I guess that's why they started burying people down into the earth so they could be closer to hell and it wouldn't be such a long trip. <laughs> 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 All right, so here's what here's what what's that? It's harder to bury them on stilts. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> probably smart. A little closer maybe to heaven. Right. I like that. Um, I'm I'm gonna Nadine's gonna send me up on a rocket ship when my time is up. <laughs> All right, so this is where we've ended up. Uh, we have the Islam <laughs> teaching us that heaven and hell are conditions within us. Uh, we have the Kabbalists who are reinterpreting the Bible in symbolic terms. Don't worry, life is hard, but be happy. Uh, we have the Christians. Every word of the Bible is literally true. God is out to get you. Better put on your helmet. <laughs> and then we have the atheists. What's going on here? Where's my telescope? <laughs> and so my final question, we have four minutes, three minutes to talk about this. Was the Reformation a step in the right direction or a step backwards in terms of human understandings of God, or was it a little of both? Mm -hmm. Did we make progress? Or? Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps backwards, mm -hmm. two steps backwards one step forward. I don't know. Two steps backward, one foot step forward, Nadine said. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I think that, you know, everything was evolving people were asking a lot of questions they're just trying to understand and it got really messy i think but um i think things change over time people the more they understand the more questions they have and so we'll just continue to evolve we pray for that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I find it sad that it's the uh... The fear and anxiety of of Martin Luther and that Reformation that's kind of stuck to some Christians, you know, and uh, at the guilt and and the you know just always being fearful doesn't seem like a very good religion anymore for me. <laughs> no. I, I, yeah, I like I like listening to Jesus's words, <laughs> and I try not to try not to get bothered by, you know, some of that anxiety that our religion puts on us. <laughs> I think the positive, though, was you don't need an intermediary to go to God. 
And that's a significant difference between old Christianity and after the Reformation. Mm -hmm. There's also a move towards the Bible should be accessible to everybody and not simply uh, the clergy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, again, I think there are some positive steps, but there are some negative mm -hmm. steps. I would agree that I think I think it's both. I think they discuss it. On a historical aspect, why I like the Reformation and a reason why a lot of us are even in this room is the Protestant movement is what allowed us to be this country of where we're at today. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what forced a lot of our ancestors to hop across the pond yeah. and to migrate and immigrate. And so there's there's a profound effect of the Reformation. Yeah, so there are huge historical impacts yes. from, from the evolutionist religious That's thought, for sure. All right. Well, Jonathan and I have to go be up front here in about 15 <laughs> minutes. So, thank you, Paul. You did a great job. Oh, uh, this was a tough supposed... chapter. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I was supposed to teach thank last you. week, but we got pushed back. So okay. it wasn't, it wasn't your fault. So, do you know the picture on the left? The cape of 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 God is. Oh, you just took it off, Paul. Oh, sorry. Ah. Anyway, um, if you look at that, that actually is the side view of the brain. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, they kind of. Oh, do. yeah. Mm. Cortical skin. Yep. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? We need another hour to talk about that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Wow, I never even noticed that before. We and I've it. been there. Time to go back to Rome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about the symbolism that Michelangelo uh, put into into that painting. It will mm. give, really give you something to think about. Wow. Yeah. Well, and he was the one that was really into science and the body and all of that, wasn't he? Uh huh. So mm. he had actually yeah. taken apart bodies, and that's what he knew, which was not yeah. a big no no. You mm -hmm. weren't supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm. You know what they call those people. Paul, you broke that down so nice. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's tough. This is a thank this is both. a very challenging book. There's so much material in it. Um, mm -hmm. I wish you guys could have heard the first six or seven chapters. I don't know how, how much of that. Well, we've got them on tape, don't we? I wasn't here last week. I don't know if you were here last we week. We were on YouTube. So. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, you don't want to shut down. The meeting right I, i'm not going to shut down the meeting i'm just trying to shut down my slides and then i'm going to leave this for you you know my favorite part was the breaking down of the the Jewish metaphor of the breaking of the pottery yeah that yeah. was really just a beautiful poetic way well i thought at the time you know of course when the rabbi explained it he didn't go into all the detail as to where that had come from but i just thought it was a great yes um great way to look at our um the, the, the way we're, I guess, kind of unified with God in a common endeavor uh, to help the world, you know. Uh, but I, I had no idea that that was born out of the uh, Jewish mystical experience until I read this book and kind of did a little exploring. That was wonderful. Yeah. So much part of who he is, he didn't even probably maybe know. What's that? I mean, did the rabbi even kind of know where the genesis of that oh i'm sure was. he did he was extremely knowledgeable okay. but we were a bunch of rookie christians so he didn't, <laughs> sure didn't want to yeah. overwhelm us with too much okay oh what for next week we on to the next chapter who's, in uh, who's, who's doing next week Dennis. i am chapter nine enlightenment it's a long chapter like 53 pages yeah yeah, get ready. <laughs> get ready. Yeah, we're depending on you. The whole thing. And yeah. We'll get it done. Oh, Dennis, I tell you, that's I had 50 pages too. And <laughs> I I wish I had done it the way Paul did it. He's he just does a really good job with the overview. Well, thank it's you. really so, it's really I, hard to organize her text. Yeah, it is. I think about how limited my brain is to absorb all this stuff and I think sometimes just if you can leave me with a couple of key points, I do better than trying to memorize everything. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we're going to go get ready for worship and.